Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So, I'm Ella. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Ella. Um, so, I have a little bit over two and a half, two, 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 a little over two years of sobriety. Um, my sobriety date is Christmas of 2016. I have a sponsor and uh, two sponsees. Um, so, I'll just start at the beginning. Um, I was born into a sober household, meaning both of my parents are sober because they're alcoholics and they were sober. I've never seen them take a drink, so they have about 30 years each, which was a blessing and a curse for me at the time because um, I had conscious parents that like loved me and were present and I didn't get to see them you know, drink, but also I felt like I had this really weird relationship with alcohol. Um, it was like, no, that's bad. Like, that's, we don't do that here. Like, I just had this sort of weird, like, I remember, like, my older sister would have a beer. She's not an alcoholic. And I would just be like, no. So I had this very black and white thinking from a really early age. Um, I struggled with food addiction. My first addiction was that I felt an like an alien as a kid. Um, I felt super, like... I wasn't supposed to be there, um, but like everything looked good on the outside. It was totally fine, but I was like suicidal at age 10, which is very strange. Um, but <clears throat> so my first drink was when I was 13 and I blacked out and it was super scary. Um, and I remember feeling the feelings in the beginning were, were similar to the feelings at the end. It was like, who knows about this? Who found out? I'm a piece of sh- I'm I'm bad. <laughs> um, you know, like all this remorse already. Like it's supposed to be fun. I'm 13. It wasn't. Um, so I didn't drink again for a little bit, and um, and I was already lying and just like feeling really, really already bad about because I because I knew about alcoholics, right? Like I I'd been going to meetings with my parents forever. Like I knew about the thing. Like, you're not supposed to be the thing. So um, I drank, you know, normally in high, normally in high school. Um, I remember quickly just, like, choosing the friends who drink. Like, you know, um, not really focusing on a ton of school, but still, like, managing. I was, like, captain of, you know, sports teams and... But then I just, I remember something started to feel weird. It was like, I was noticing that I was drinking like everyone else, but in the mornings, like, I would feel not like every, I could see them like get up and like go to school and not be depressed. But like, I woke up with this just like crushing depression. And I noticed that Um, it was either because I'd blacked out and I was really feeling sorry about myself, but I was just noticing this pattern. Like I wasn't like normal people, the way I reacted to alcohol, even sober. So, um, I just, I kept going with it. It was fine. I didn't think I had a problem, but then the blackouts became more and more and more. Um, and I was failing classes. I wasn't going to school. I, um, wasn't captain of my team anymore which was like a big deal to me at the time um just stuff like that I was blacking out like almost every time I drank so that was really scary for me like I remember um my mom my mom would say it's like Russian roulette like every single time you try to you like have the first drink you don't know if you're gonna black out like I didn't know if I was gonna black out I couldn't control it so in my head I wanted to be like okay I really like to be drunk, right? Like I love to be drunk, but I just will control it. So I won't black out. And that was my form of like controlled drinking. It was never like, I'll have one and not get drunk. It was just like, don't black out. Um, but I couldn't do it. So 
I found myself after a, a night of like getting brought home by the cops. I was like, well, maybe I should try AA. It's not the worst thing that I could do. Um, I think I was 17 at the time and, um, I was suicidal. I was really sad. I had no friends. I was doing really bad at school. Um, and I went and I was like, this is not for me. Like, I'm not like you. I'm 17. Like, how am I supposed to relate with you guys? Like I didn't get a DUI. I didn't, um, I wasn't drinking around the clock. And for me, I had this built in idea of what an al alcoholic should look like is just sort of this 60 year old guy, like really red face, like hasn't talked to someone in like 20 years besides like the bar. I don't know. You know, like you just make up the stuff. So like I was, I was like, this is not me. Um, so I would get sober for about 30 days and then I would drink because I love the first couple of weeks of drinking because in that time you're sort of conscious of it, but you can still like drink a little bit like the way you want. But then the blackouts come again and the dysfunction comes again and the like drinking every day comes again. So it was progressive. It was like in the, in the more about alcoholism, um, it's just like, it gets worse and never better. I can, I can say that that's true. Um, I don't think I was ready to get sober at the time that I did when I first came in, but I learned, I learned over time, just like kept knocking my head against the wall, just being like, I can drink normally. Maybe these people in AA don't like drinking as much as I do is one of the thoughts in my head. It was like, if you're really an alcoholic like me, you wouldn't be sane and sober and like, whatever. <laughs> so, um, so finally, like my last drink, it was after, you know, really bad bout with this with this guy and I drag dr dr drug him through the whatever and um I got sober I, my I had like a glass of wine on Christmas Eve and then the next day I was like I've had it like I remember feeling like when when I was drunk it wasn't working because I wanted to be sober like I wanted to be I was like I just want to be sober again like that was kind of cool but then when I was sober I wanted to be drunk um so I couldn't, I couldn't picture my life with or without alcohol at that point, like they say in the book. So, um, I went to a meeting. I knew some people from my in and out of AA sort of thing. So I had some contacts cause I did what my sponsor suggested, which was to get numbers. So I, I got a bunch of numbers and, um, I started doing the steps and like, you know, it still was really painful. It was super painful. Cause now I couldn't, um, I couldn't, I didn't have a solution. So I was like trying to find it in other people in AA. Like that was my big thing was to date in AA and like, you know, like go out after a month, but date in AA. So, um, yeah, I don't know. But then finally something clicked where I was like, these experiences with this God thing is kind of like cool. Like I would notice oh, it was this, this relationship that was growing and I didn't even know it. It was like, huh? Like, my life isn't so bad. Or I would wake up feeling like, wow, I haven't wanted to kill myself in like a month. Um, and that just kept kind of happening. And like, I think in my life now, I try to practice just like letting go and seeing what happens. Like I got to move to California. I'm from Maine. I got to move to California. I was given a brand new life, um, in AA, you know, and <sighs> Um, I have like a, the job of my dreams. I have a dog. I have like great friends here and I couldn't like have done that without AA cause it, you guys took me in when I got here. Um, and it was really painful to move. Like it's painful to move anyways, but when you're sober, you're like, ah, how do you, okay, one minute. Um, but so what I found now is just like, once I'm sort of like, once I, just surrender and just like, wow, I'm totally not in control anymore, you know? And I, I start to see things like I start to, um, start doing things that like I wouldn't do. It's like something else, you know? And that's just through the steps. Like I, I find myself being like, that's not me. Like I would just like doing kind of selfless acts out of nowhere. Like, whoa, that was like a little surprising, Ella. Um, but yeah, I don't know. My, my life is amazing. Um, it's life, but it's amazing. And it's, you know, cause I'm sober and cause I haven't felt the need to take a drink in the past 
two years or so. So yeah, thank you guys for asking me. Hi, I'm Jason Alcoholic. Uh, my recovery date is October 6, 1992. Um, I was 22 years old, and um, and I'd only really drank at that point for about just under five years, and um, and it did, you know, it didn't take long before, um, you know, before things were out of control, and I didn't control it. And I remember. Um, one of the first meetings that I went to was probably like, I think the third meeting I went to, uh, it was a big book meeting and they, somebody was reading the big book about all those, the links that, you know, all the different things that we tried to control our drinking. And, and I remember listening to that list and I'm like going, oh, that one, you know, and going through it. And it was like all these different things, um, that I could identify with. And I think that was the moment that it clicked, uh, for me. The, uh, at the time, I think, and I also, the, the other reason why I got sober, I was 22 years old, it was, um, I had gone into the uh, Coast Guard, and I was stationed on a little island in Virginia, and uh, prior to that, I was in another, in, in Mar uh, Ocean City, Maryland, it was, uh, it was like a beach resort town there on the East Coast, and uh, I was asked to leave there and got sent to another, to the other unit down in Virginia, and uh it was because of my alcohol, you know, because of my alcohol is because of the way I drank. I, the, uh, I was building a reputation there, even in this resort town where there was a lot of, a lot of drinking, a lot of bars and stuff. I had a pretty bad reputation. So when I ended up down on that, uh, that other Island, it was about 3000 people lived there. Um, Chincoteague Island, Virginia, uh, that reputation blossomed and, and I didn't really care about the reputation that I, I had done. I just knew that, my life was just, it was out of control and I was doing things that I didn't, um, that I wasn't proud of. I was, uh, you know, fly, you know, had a blacking out on a pretty regular basis. I was not performing at, at the manner in which I would have liked to have performed at work. And, um, and I was living in constant fear of what was going to happen. Um, what was going to happen when I was in a blackout? What was going to happen? When, um, you know, as far as, you know, my job, I grew up, you know, my, I, I, my family was, uh, pretty poor and, and, um, and I went into the military to, to get money for school. And I looked at this as my, as a chance of kind of getting out of that, of that cycle that I saw my, you know, I saw going for me and going, going on. And, um, and I looked at it, that drinking was going to take that away from me. And, um, I know it, it's not, it's not a, very low bottom for a lot of people, um, but it was my bottom, and it was something that I was trying for a long time to try to control, you know, my drink, stop getting in trouble, learn how to drink and have, you know, go out and have a couple drinks or not end up in that position. And the more often than not, that if I tried to say, okay, I'm just going to go out, I'm going to have a few drinks and, you know, I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll be back home and in bed by nine o'clock. That would be the time when, when I would definitely be at the worst blackout and wake up and my car would be gone. Cause I'd leave it someplace that I'd get on my bike. I'd ride my bike to work and, and stop in the bars that I usually would be at and hopefully find my car. And sometimes I did. Sometimes I didn't leave. Then at lunch, I'd go ride around to some of the other bars that might be on the second string. And, and sometimes I find my car and a couple of times I didn't. And, you know, somebody would eventually tell me that the car was left at their house or whatever. Or um, one time I didn't find my car for, for three days and the neighbor said, you parked your car behind my house. Why is it there? And so, and I'm like, and these guys, and, and these guys were, they lived in this trailer. It's like these two guys and they used to be, they were like probably about 12 years older than me. And they used to be in the Coast Guard. So they used to say, oh, you remind me of me and myself when I was your age and all this stuff. And and I'm looking at them and the way, you know, they were, they were chronic alcoholics, you know, and, um, and their life was a mess. And I'd look at them and I go, I guess this is where I'm going, you know? And, um, and that's basically where I was heading. And I, uh, I finally, what ended up happening was I was trying to, to figure out ways to control and I was doing all these different things and nothing was happening or nothing, nothing worked. And, um, I knew about, 
AA, I knew that did some. I didn't understand exactly what AA was, but I knew that people, if you had some, you know, you had a problem with drinking, you went to AA and, and you figured it out. I, my idea was that you, know, you come into these rooms and people tell, tell you you learn how to drink without getting into trouble or something. Um, that's kind of what, what I thought it was. So, um, but the only meeting that I knew about was on the Coast Guard base on the island, you know, and, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't even think to look in the phone book, you know, it's anonymous. There's not going to be a phone number for it. I didn't even think about hotlines or anything like that. So I asked, um, one of the, one of the guys that I worked with was the command drug and alcohol rep about where there was some other AA meetings. And, and he said, uh, cause I don't know if I'll find out. So he went and asked the person that he reported to, and they told him that, um, that I needed to go because I asked that, that that's me turning myself in for my drinking or something, asking for help. So they had to send me to a, uh, to go to a, um, naval, um, to the U S Navy had, uh, alcohol, uh, counselors, alcohol abuse counselors. And I was going to get screened and I, you know, I, I lied. I cut all my drinking in half and all that stuff. And they still said I was an alcoholic. <laughs> and, um, so they told me I was going to be going to what we, what we referred to it. It was to rehab, but in the military we called it drunk school. So I was going to be going to drunk school, and but it was going to be, you know, a couple months later. So that was, um, but that no, it was going to be a month and a half later. But that was in October fifth that I went to that screening, and I or October fourth, and so I knew that it was going to take a couple days before my command got the notification that. Um, that I was, I was um, diagnosed as an alcoholic, and that I was not supposed to drink and stuff. So I said, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it on," you know. And um, so I went. And I met met my my boat, and we went. We were in Ocean City. We went to Ocean City, Maryland, and and I had every intention of uh, getting getting stunned that that day. And um, and they they kept following me around. The people I was working with, they kept they wouldn't let me drink that much, you know. And I never got about my last drink. I never, I didn't get drunk. I didn't, I don't even remember feeling anything. And it was pissed me off. I was angry. You might know that. You might identify with being angry for not being drunk. And um, even though you had every intention, um, not being able to drink enough to get drunk. And that was my last drink. And um, so I went to that, that first meeting I went to was on the, the Coast Guard base. And that was October 6th. 1992 and I walked in there there was this uh, guy he was a retired uh, corrections officer from Boston and um, he was there he was in there he was the, the secretary of the meeting and he knew that I was going to come the Coast Guard told him so he grabbed me and he said listen kid alcohol take your fucking this take this take that ba -ba 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 -ba, and just laying it all out there in my face and I'm like looking I'm going uh, and I'm thinking to myself Stay away from that guy. He's a fucking nut. And um, that guy became my sponsor, you know. Um, it, it, but it, it didn't happen right away. You know? I asked this other this other guy, Owen M, to be my sponsor, and and it worked out pretty good. He started me going into the steps, and um, and but it wasn't. He wasn't. Um, it, he lived a little too far away from where I lived there, and. Um, and he and I, and I needed somebody that was going to give me a little bit more direction. He was Owen was more of a friend. I needed somebody that was going to be uh, a little bit more forceful, a little bit more blunt. And um, so I eventually asked uh, Coley to be my sponsor. And he goes, "Well, why are you asking me to be your sponsor? You got Owen." I go, "Well, you know, I needed you know something that's closer and some a little bit more direction." He goes, "Yeah, you wanted you need to hear the truth, and you're afraid of the truth, and so you asked me." And he was completely right. Is that is that I didn't want to hear the truth. I wanted it, you know, I wanted, as it says, an easier, softer way. I wanted, um, you know, I wanted to just show up, you know, get, sign the attendance slip, get the, and then get the diploma, you know, not have to do the work, not have to, not have to really immerse myself in it because I didn't really think uh, that I belonged there. Um, you know, I didn't, couldn't really, you know, I, I, this whole thing was, you know, I was just trying to, I didn't, I didn't get it. But then I would think about these things. I'm listening to this stuff. I go, well, maybe if I could just drink and just drink just enough that I can not. And I, and I, but I still was playing those games in my head. You know, I never went and drank again, but those things were going on. And it was, and it was, 
it was an uncomfortable place to be because I felt like I wanted to be drunk. I felt like the only way I could deal with what was going on around me, um, where I was, and the people that I was around was to be to be drunk and um, to have to have alcohol. And um, and I, that's when you know really I'm hearing people talk about the steps, and I started going getting into the steps and 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 working that. And so I think step two was a big part was really looking at where my life was unmanageable and and it and it wasn't you know it was real easy to say okay my life's unmanageable because I keep losing my car my life's unmanageable because you know I'm on this little island people and I meet people oh I know you you're you're that crazy guy that drives that white car this you're in that you, know, you live over there on North End, North Main Street and you're in the Coast Guard you, you're bad you're wild and somebody says you're wild in the south that's not a good thing um that's a bad thing that's that's you you might as well be killing dogs and raping chickens and shit like that because that's bad um so and that and that's kind of you know and that's how i felt i knew i knew what they meant and i knew i had that reputation um and through that, the steps was, you know, I saw that the unmanageability went way back. It went back to when I was a kid. It went back to how I, how I dealt with things, you know, or viewed things and believed things to be and tried to manage things, tried to control things and tried to control my life. And, um, and then going through that and going into the third step. And the third step was hard because I, you know, it was hard to figure out what decision was and what it wasn't and really looking at that word saying, okay, you know, you know, I looked, you know, I kept reading and I said, you know, I'm going to, you know, turn my life and my will over to the care of God. Not the decision part, you know, it's not making that decision. I'm going to go forward and I'm going to find a way to do, make, to turn my life over. But thinking I had to do it all right then. You know, I didn't, you know, it took working with Coley to say, hey, you know, you're going to do the fourth step. And through the fourth step, it's going to put you onto the fifth step and it's going to put you onto the sixth step. And that seventh step is where that where you start turning your life over. That's really where it starts to happen. Um, you know, I looked and I was like, third step, I got to do it. And I kept getting into that, that you know, um, that waltz of being that one, two, three, one, two, three, keep going back and not getting past the third step, feeling like, oh, I didn't do it enough. I need to go back. And Coley knocked me back out, knocked me out of that and got me into writing. And I uh, was finished I had one last thing to do with with my uh, four step and I had gotten on a plane I was a year sober and I was flying out to uh, out here and I was getting uh, transferred to Petaluma and so I finished up my four step writing there on the plane and I went to the um, it was in the Golden Eagle shopping center this was 1993 and uh, the fall. And, um, and I went to a meeting there, there was a meeting room there and I got a sp sponsor there and, um, talked to him and we did the fifth step there that fall in, in Petaluma. It was a beautiful, uh, fall day. I remember the sun was setting and we were in a park and I read, you know, spent a couple hours reading through the, uh, four step with him. And then he set me off to do my sixth step. And it was, um. That was a big change. You know, that was a that was a really important moment. And when I met that guy, because I was a year sober, and he said, "You're a year sober," and, and I'm thinking, "Oh, I'm great. I got this shit. I'm a year sober, <laughs> feeling badass." And uh, he's like, "You know," and, and he's like, "You know, you, you know, you're you're fucking wasting everybody's time. You know, there's newcomers in here that you know they're coming in and they need you to be ready to sponsor them because they're 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 desperate." And that you need to get yourself at least to the tenth step by the time of your first, you know, your first year, so you can be sponsoring people because people need you. You know, um, you, you know, I don't use. I could give a shit what's going on with you, but I care about the newcomer. The newcomer needs you, and that was really important to, to hear because I need to hear about how serious this was outside of my life, outside of me, and that kind of clicked me back. I mean, Coley was really good with this, but Tommy, you know, it's, it was my sponsor in Petaluma was was able to direct me into that stuff into where I was getting into into real action and real service. And lo and behold, I'm you know, I get to the to the tenth step. And, I, and this was before, you know, email and Facebook and all the internet shit. So doing not um doing my ninth step was really hard to do. You know, I had my list and stuff, 
but because I'm across the country, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C., then I go to this little island, and then now I'm in California, it was hard to connect with people. So trying to make some phone calls, writing letters and stuff like that. Um, so my ninth step was extended, but he said, you know, you can only you do the step, you do this each step to the best of your ability. The only one that you have to do perfectly is the first step because the first step, if you fall down those steps, that landing better catch you because if not, you're fucked. And he was really blunt with me, and I still I tell that to my sponsors now. Um, and uh, I took that with me. I left there. I went to Boston, Massachusetts, and I got a sponsor there, Chris M, and um, continued to work the steps with Chris M. Um, in that time, I ended up having a conscious contact with my higher power, uh, which it, for, for me, it was easy to just say God because of where society is and culture. I think it's easier to just use that term. It's something that's very, it's a single syllable. It's really easy for me to understand. It's just important that, it, that I know that it's something that's not me mm -hmm. and that I have to, I can rely on, on, on. And, um, you know, that, Higher power was with me. I went. I went on the ship and I sailed all over the uh, Atlantic and into the Pacific, and went to meetings all throughout the Caribbean and Canada, um, South America, and um, and was in some really crazy things. And you know, I they uh, I remember it was in 1996, and it was right before my uh, you know my third anniversary and my third birthday in AA, and and we had. Uh, boarded the ship and I was on a boarding team and it was filled, filled with cocaine and um, had six and a half tons of coke from Columbia and uh, they tried to kill us, me and me and the crew that was on there. Uh, we lived and we got off the ship and all this stuff and and we it was a long story short, unexpectedly I pulled into Guantanamo Bay and I was able to go to the meeting it was my anniversary, I was able to pick up my, my, my Three year medallion on my birthday, and I wasn't expecting we weren't supposed to hit another port till mm -hmm. I think probably another week and a half. So, that I look at those are things like I look at it was a God shot, you know, something where something happened there that shouldn't have happened. You know, I sur you know, I survived that boarding, and I remember it was, it was a really scary moment, you know, scary, uh, scary 12 hours that we were on that ship, and um, you know, and then but I survived that. I went on, and and I went, you know. As a result of that, I was able to spend some time in Miami at the trial for the, the uh, captain and the engineer of that ship. And there I'm going to meetings and I'm really meeting people. I'm doing some, some, some work and um, spending these different times in different places, attending meetings and making some really strong connections with people. And people down there that I'm still, in, you know, 20-something years later, I'm still friends with. Um, and that's been the amazing thing is that wherever I go, you know, I, even though I've never been there, I have many friends there because there's AA. If I go into a meeting, I'm going to have those friends. Um, I'm going to have that that connection that is at a level that people outside of these rooms don't have the opportunity. That's a gift that we get, and I think that's a gift to my higher power. Um, continued on, and, and I have this great relationship with my higher power. You know, I believe, you know, as a result, I looked at that moment where I was pulled into Guantanamo Bay as... You know, I looked at that as, as, as the 12 step realized, you know, that was a spiritual awakening was here's these things. I did this stuff. I let it go. I prayed when I was in that moment, when I knew what was happening, I let it go and let it to God. I survived. And then we got the notice a couple of days later to pull into, to get well. And I was able to get that chip. And I was just kind of, I looked at that. And these are the things I had this, this, uh, things in my life were really good and things were going, you know, were going good because I had this relationship with with my higher power and I left uh, the Coast Guard in uh, 2000 and, and, um, and I eventually I became a police officer in Massachusetts and um, when and I'm still you know I'm going to meetings I'm doing stuff it was hard for me to sponsor people because of my job and the, the uh, and be as active in meetings because I worked overnight shift it shifted around um, I still attended meetings. I still worked with my sponsor. Sponsoring people was difficult. Never had anybody that ever was able to get past their third step. Um, usually they left to go to somebody else because I wasn't able to be there for them. But, um, but I was, I was, you know, I was definitely involved in AA as best I could and, and, um, had a good, good community. Um, and then in, um, a few weeks after my 11th anniversary, 
in a, I went to a call where a man pulled a gun on me. He was going to kill his wife and, um, and he shot at me. I hid be, I dove behind my cruiser and, um, and he engaged two other officers in a, in, in a gunfight and then I returned fire. And he was, um, he succumbed to his injuries. And, uh, but no, the wife didn't, was, was able, we able, we kept him from the wife's house and we, uh, we saved her life and no, nobody else was injured. Um, as a result of that, I suffered psychological trauma from that. And, and, um, and that, that, you know, that became a thing that became a, uh, uh, for me, it manifested into a resentment against my higher power. And, um, you know, because I was there, I'm praying, I'm asking God, you know, take this away when I'm feeling this. And I'm sitting there. Like when when I'm not working or different times, I'm seeing the barrel of that gun because when I stop the guy, I'm ten feet away from him, looking down the barrel of this Colt 1911-45, and I couldn't get that away from me. And then it got to the point where I'm thinking about drinking, you know, because I'm thinking this is the only thing that's going to take this away. You know, I want to escape from what I'm feeling here, what's happening to me, and um, you know, I'm feeling, I'm praying to God to take this stuff away from me and this feelings, these, this feelings of that I should be dead, that I should have died. Um, you know, and I'm not drinking. I'm going to meetings and I'm praying. I'm asking for help and, and it's not, you know, I feel it's not happening. It's not coming. Um, what I do now as I look back now, it, it was there. I, it was, it was, God puts those tools, you know, I believe God puts those tools in front of me if I choose to pick those up and go and deal with them. So God doesn't move, God will move mountains, but he gives you the shovel to move that mountain. So I just chose not to pick up that shovel, not to use that tool to get help and to seek out help. And, um, and it became a, you know, a, 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 a 13 year old year, uh, journey of getting worse and worse. Having another person pull a gun on me in 2006, um, more trauma, children dead bad car accidents, a lot of domestic violence, and it kept getting worse and worse. And I did, instead of drinking to deal with that, I did other things, and the other things were, believe it or not, it was funny, I went to these things for uh, PTSD, and these guys were going, I was shooting heroin, I was drinking, I was doing it. And they're like, get to me, what'd you do? I put on charity events. <laughs> and and it's a funny thing, you know, and I, I laughed, it was like, <laughs> but what I did with it, did it compulsively. I told my wife, you know, so I got divorced one, once, in 2006 and then I remarried then 2016 I get divorced again and the second wife she was like you know stop putting on these things you know I've got stuff I, I need you I need you to be here I need you to be present for me and I'd be like yeah I won't do it I won't do anymore I won't get myself into anything else I'd find out about a, a cop that was killed in an ambush at a domestic violence call and I'd feel guilty I feel like I should be dead mm -hmm. what do I do to make myself feel better I put on another charity event, another thing to, uh, to you know, to alleviate that guilt. And, of course, the guilt only goes away for a little bit, comes back, but I'm doing this compulsively, just like a, like I did when I was drinking, just like a person does when they're, they're on, on drugs. And, um, and needless to say, that marriage ended, and I had another episode happen at work, and at that point I went and I asked for help. Um, in that time, I reconnected with my higher power. I started, which was... And another thing that happened was I ended up um, leaving, being put in, put out on workers' comp, and having the opportunity to spend to go to consistent meetings. Um, I found three men's meetings that I went to Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday near my house in New Hampshire. Got a sponsor. My uh, other sponsor that I had, you know, uh, you know, had passed away in 2012. And I didn't get a new sponsor and just kind of was rolling along, had meetings here, had meetings there. And, um, you know, just being, being miserable, being, um, you know, being a rudderless ship, so to speak. And, um, so this thing, these things happen and I had, and I asked for help and, um, got taken off the street and I'm going to meetings and I get a sponsor and I'm going to consistent meetings. People are knowing me. I'm, you know, I'm doing, some, you know, some service work in the meetings, making coffee, setting up, you know, chair, you know, doing the secretary chair, things, things, do things different there than they do here. Um, but being involved and um, getting back and doing the steps again. 
And um, basically, the the guy who was sponsoring me, you know, here I, you know, I, and I go in there. It's funny. I went in there on twenty years, so you know, twenty something years sober, and this guy that sponsored me is four years sober, but. He's four years sober, quality sober time, quality recovery, quality, quality time in the steps, and um, and he has a relationship with a higher power that he trusts and that, that helps guide him, and that's what I needed. And so, I um, I started working on the steps again, and a big point of that of that step work with with Ward was to um, to trust God and to get past that resentment. And to really get back into the second step, that unmanageability, where I was trying to control everything because I wasn't, I didn't have a relationship with God and I wasn't letting my higher power handle things and I was running the show. Things really went bad and trying to get it. And you know what? I did to the best ability I could then, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough, and which I soon uh, came to find out. Um, so, but I was getting better, and I wasn't cursing my higher power. I was uh, showing up to meetings. I was less angry. I was um, starting to pray and meditate. The meditation was easy. The praying was hard. And um, things got better and better. They still weren't perfect, but they were better, and I was starting to, to uh, feel comfortable in my own skin. I had a, you know, I had a good community in AA. I started... Uh, I re-sponsored a guy that I, that I had sponsored 10 years before. Um, unfortunately, he never was able to get more than a month uh, month without a drink. But um, I can report now that he has uh, seven months right now, and I'm really happy about that. And, um, but he's, he's back in Massachusetts. And then in um, April of 2017, I was in New Jersey at a, at a show, and somebody did stage dive, landed on my head, and I broke my neck. And I was paralyzed from the neck down. And I tell you, and the reason I bring this up, it has nothing to do with drinking or anything like that. But I was laying there on my back looking at the ceiling, and I had been doing all this work for a year in the steps, in with the therapist and dealing with trauma. And I was fine with where I was because I knew I was safe right then. I knew it hurt. You know, it felt weird. I couldn't move anything below my neck, you know, below my neck. But I was, um, I knew I was going to be safe. I knew I was going to be okay. I knew that people that had suffered spinal cord injuries had been, you know, gone on and, and lived and they've gone through it. And I knew I would, you know, I had, I had that faith. But right at that moment, I knew I was safe. 20 minutes later, I was in the, in the emergency room. And then a, day, you know, a couple of days later, they fused my spine. I started to be able to, you know, move my feet. And then my hands and, you know, and then uh, about two weeks later, I'm, I'm starting to be able to feed myself and end up in Boston in the hospital and, uh, and spent, you know, spent three, uh, three weeks in, or two and a half weeks in, uh, in spinal rehab. I had to relearn how to walk and do everything that I had to do. And in that place was a meeting that I used to attend in Charlestown and they had the meeting there in the hospital. And I would go to that meeting when, uh, when, when they had it. And, and it was a meeting that I hadn't gone to since 1995 when I lived in North End in Boston. So that was really nice to be able to reconnect and go there. I like, felt safe. Um, and because of the, that injury, my father lives in the East Bay here. And so I, the cold temperature when, when the fall came in 2017, it was really bad. So... <laughs> I um still waiting to retire from the police department. I said, well, I can stay here. So I've been, came out here in May for, brought my dog out here. And um, came out here, I found a home group, the Men's Answer Group on Tuesday night in San Leandro. Got a sponsor who I've been working with. And, um, and I sponsored two people. One guy, um, shortly after, the week after I found my sponsor there, this, my sponsee found me. And, um, because I've worked in the steps with him and I've really, what I've been doing with the steps and stuff and my dis, I said, you know, I need to go through this again. So I, I started working through the steps again because there were a lot of questions and stuff that was coming through that I knew, I knew I needed to, to have a better answer for, for my sponsor, you know, for me too, but also for him. And, um, you know, so 
you know, I, I, I work this. And what out of that came, I, every morning I get, I get on my knees and I read, um, 86 to 88, the big book starting up on, you know, on awakening and, um, meditate and then pray. And I pray for the people and institutions that I have resentments against and ask them to have what I would want and only ask for myself what would benefit others. And, um, that's working. It's working really good. Um, it's something that I used to do back prior to 2003. And, um, and it's a good thing. Uh, as far as the battle that I have with PTSD, it's still there. Um, it's something that's never going to go away. It's just like alcoholism. I know this singleness of purpose, but, um, but you know, it says in the big book, if we have problems with other things, we go to professionals. And that's something that I want is it in my story is that I had to go to professionals for, for these other things. Um, that battle that I'm dealing with, with the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts in regards to my retirements going on, I'm going to be uh, going back there to Massachusetts. I was just there two weeks ago. I'm going back next week. And then on April 6th, I'm going to be going back, moving back into my house and uh, until everything's completed. It should be done. It should be back here in July. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a fight that, that I you know, that I, I need to do because I'm definitely, I lost, I lost a career that I was passionate about. I was really good at what I did in that job, um, from whether it was locking up drunk drivers and they'd be in there and there were people that I knew from meetings and they say, well, what are you locking me up? I said, well, you know, you just did 12 step work. You're keeping me sober because of saying, well, for the grace of God, there go I. Um, other times I stopped people, they were speeding, they're going to they, they say, oh, also, we're, we got to get to the meeting. At, it's a noon meeting. If we don't get there on time, they take attendance and shit. So I walk back. Everything was fine. I walk back up to the car. And I said, well, when you get to that meeting, you know, ask your sponsor to, you know, you need, let them know you need to do a 10 step on your line. Because you know, um, I'm a member of this fellowship. And, <laughs> you know, and they were like, whoa, you know, so, but, you know, I, I have to say that that was important. That, that kept me sober. Um, I was good at that, but what I was really good at was um, was uh, was responding to domestic violence calls, and um, and it was something that I was passionate about. Um, you know, I knew where I grew up, and I, you know, and I, you know, I was like I said, I was poor. Most of the people that I worked with were not didn't come from the type of background that I did, didn't live in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and um, so they didn't understand what 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 it was to be poor and desperate or to be stuck in circumstances that were beyond their control. And I um so we go, you know, most most times it takes probably five to seven times before a uh, a victim leaves their batter and I never gave up on that. And that's the thing that I miss the most about that job is that the people that I could could walk into their life and they were in the most crisis and I could be there for them. The only way, and the reason I bring that up, I know this is AA, but the reason I bring that up is because I'm able, I was able to do that and able to connect with people and able to, to um, work in that manner because of the principles that I learned in here in AA and learned about that, you know, we, uh, we all come from such diverse backgrounds and that no matter how far down the scale we can, we can get out. And, and that was the thing is that I wanted those people to get out. I wanted them to have a chance. Because AA gave me a chance because I wasn't going, I was destined to be in a really bad place and, um, you know, really, you know, to, to suffer um, the long term results of alcoholism. And, and I did, you know, I was able to get off of that because AA provided that for me. And if I could help provide that person, because I saw a number of those people that were victims were alcoholics and become alcoholics because of the of the result of domestic violence. Um, that's how they coped. And um, so seeing that, knowing that they could get where they go, oh, well, so-and-so over there, she's just a drunk, and she's just saying she, well, you know, I knew, I knew otherwise. And they left their batteries. And, um, and I'm very proud of that, and I will carry that. I just have to learn to accept that I can't do that job in that manner anymore, and maybe there's something else. And, you know, I think, I think my higher power will 
will show that to me, and I've got some. There's some things that are happening that I think will provide those to me. Um, I just have to let it go, make that happen. But in the meantime, I have to stay sober today, show up tomorrow, and be there for my sponsees, and um, and live this, live this the way that that you guys set the example for me, the way that that you know that from. From the time that Ebby showed it to Bill and Bill showed it to Bob and it went through from Akron, the way that they did it and the way that they, that the 12 steps work, you know, it's not perfect, but we do it to the best we can. As long as I do it the best I can, I'm going to, I'm going to be able to lay my head down and feel good. And when I do my 10th step, I'm not going to have as much to, to, to worry about. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.